Hi again, everybody. I'm going to finish up this handout, fluid and electrolytes, and we just have to do magnesium and phosphorus. So I want to kind of keep this brief. We talked about uh, the fluids, super important to understand that concept, potassium, sodium, big electrolytes that we really pay attention to every day when we take a look at lab work. Calcium is another big one that can give us some information and just keep in mind that the, the uh, cardiac electrolytes, sodium, potassium, calcium. Okay, so they become critical for that reason that we need that for action potential and, and electrical conduction. So let's take a look at the next one, which would be phosphorus. Um, phosphorus promotes the function of muscles, red blood cells in the nervous system. Again, nerves for the nerve impulses, electrolytes play a huge role in any type of nerve activity. Some food sources, beef, pork, dried beans, peas, cheese, selfish, shellfish, fish, pumpkin seeds. So, um, you know, we think about phosphorus a lot when we think of two, two kind of groups of patients, people with high phosphorus tend to be kidney failure patients, right? Their kidneys can't clear it out. So we have to teach them what foods to avoid that are just going to cause their phosphorus levels to be high. So knowing some food um, groups that they need to avoid in that, in that state is really important. As far as a low phosphorus, often we see that in a more of like a malnourished state. If you've worked in the ICUs, um, you see these patients come in and their phosphorus are normal and a couple of days later, they, they're, they're low. They just, the phosphorus is the P in ATP and just energy is low, muscle contraction is low, phosphorus dips because they become malnourished in the ICU. Anybody who has any mal malnourishment. Very important thing, star this, to keep in mind, if you don't know this already, that phosphorus does have an inverse relationship with calcium. So anything that causes hypercalcemia, we're going to see a hypophosphatemia and vice versa. So it's an important concept. It's regulated by the parathyroid hormone as well as calcium being regulated by the parathyroid hormone. And normal phospholibers are 2.5 to 4.5. So what about hypophosphatemia, a low phosphate, causes, again, malnourished state very common reason right here malnourished state they're alcoholics icu patients who aren't don't have any food except maybe a little bit of tube feeding here and there we commonly see it in that hyperparathyroidism so think about this, this is a concept that's important to keep in mind hyperparathyroidism you would think hypercalcemia right overactive parathyroid glands hyperparathyroidism, hypercalcemia, anything that causes hypercalcemia is going to cause hypophosphatemia because of the inverse relationship. Signs and symptoms, we have, um, you know, just the neurologic, just kind of what we've talked about, weakness, numbling, num numbness, tingling, um, hypophosphatemia, if somebody has low phosphates, uh, their bones and their teeth can be fragile, Nausea, vom vomiting, anorexia, irritability, seizure, coma, death, right? If they get low enough, low enough. Uh, weakness of respiratory muscles. So this becomes a little bit later stages, but the life-threatening complications of low phosphates or hypophosphatemia are respiratory depression and arrhythmias, okay? So remember, muscles become um, weak. They just get weak muscles. The big, the diaphragm becomes weak, respiratory muscles become, and they, we struggle with, with these patients in the ICU getting them off of ventilators because their phosphates are so low. They may do really well on their trial for the first part of it, and then they just get so fatigued that they just can't continue to breathe because we have to have some nourishment and they have to have phosphates in their body. Phosphorus is required to make ATP, therefore severely low levels can lead to cardiomyopathy because the heart requ requires high levels of ATP. So again, this is this is late. You know, this is like I said, this is just what we've seen like a, maybe a chronic alcoholic who just, just never eats, just drinks, or somebody in the ICU who's just becoming so hypophosphatemic. Treatment, just like any other electrolyte, we just replace it. If somebody has a low potassium, replace it. If somebody has low sodium, one of the treatments is to replace it. Again, calcium, replace it. Phosphor, we can just replace it, PO or IV. The last one here is hyperphosphatemia. Causes of hyperphosphatemia, um, 
less common than hypophosphatemia. And here it is right here, predominantly associated with acute renal failure. Kidneys clear out the phosphorus. So we're going to see hyperphosphatemia. So, so if I see somebody with high phosphates, the first thing I look at is what is their kidneys doing? What's their BUN and creatinine? Are they clearing anything out? Same with potassium. That's the first thing that we look at. Hyperthyroidism, um, which, which can play a role in that. Hypo is the next one I want you to kind of think about. Again, this concept. Hypoparathyroidism, which would uh, cause um, a hypo calcemia, right? So think parathyroid, think calcium. Low parathyroid, low calcium. Since we have low calcium, it could lead to high phosphorus because of the inverse relationship. Severe catabolic states, conditions causing hypocalcemia, which we just said. Signs and symptoms of hyperphosphatemia, very similar to those of hypocalcemia, muscles, weakness, cramping, arrhythmias, diarrhea. What about hyperphosphatemia, a little different treatment here I want you to keep in mind because this is something we do see. Administration of a phosphate binding gel, aluminum hydroxide, you may know as alternagel or amphigel. And what this drug does is it binds phosphorus in the gut. So they take this in acid right here. When they eat, it binds the phosphorus in the food in the gut. And since it sticks, the, the phosphorus sticks to this amphigel, lowers the serum phosphorus level and helps the calcium go up. Because what this, this antacid does is it binds to the phosphorus, the antacid goes through the gut and they, they, they poop the phosphorus out since the kidneys probably are not clearing it out. Restriction of dietary phosphorus, of course, anybody with hyperphosphatemia, like a renal patient, they're going to have to watch foods that are high in phosphorus and possibly dialysis. That might be what they may need if their kidneys aren't functioning and aren't clearing the phosphorus. That might be what we need. The last one here is magnesium. President heart, bone, nerves, muscle function helps maintain electrical activity and nerve and muscles. We just said we really saw this with every one of them, right? Electrical activity in the heart, uh, is, it's very important. Even though the electrolytes for cardiac conduction is sodium, potassium, calcium, okay, that's what they need. The, the serum level of magnesium does need to be in a normal range for those electrolytes to work properly. So it is something that is important for um, electrical activity in the nerves and in the muscle, including the heart. Acts like a sedative on the muscle, like calcium. Foods, vegetables, nuts, fish, whole grains, peas, and beans. Magnesium levels are controlled by the kidneys, excreted by the kidneys, just like potassium. Normal mag is 1.5 to 2.5. This varies, again, all of these vary a little bit depending on what lab you're looking at, but I'm not going to ask you normals because normals are right there on the lab work. They're just so easy to reference. And most of you know them, at least a rate, kind of an idea anyway. Hypomagnesemia, serum magnesiums that are low, less than 1.5 causes. Um, diarrhea is pretty is, is probably number one on the list. Causes why intestines store a large amount of magnesium. So when somebody has diarrhea, they could certainly have low magnesium. Diuretics. So we talked about diuretics and we talk about which what diuretics do they they cause excretion of fluid and electrolytes. And so it's important to know what types of diuretics the patients are on and what electrolyte imbalances can occur from them. So magnesium will be depleted. Decreased intake, okay, if somebody's just not taking it. And again, chronic alcoholism. Alcoholics are malnourished, which leads to decreased mag, de decreased calcium, decreased phosphorus. All those long-term effects that we see on, on a chronic alcoholic. Signs and symptoms of a low magnesium, increased neuromuscular in irritability seizure. Again, hypomagnesium causes increased symptoms. Hyperactive deep tendon reflexes. Low magnesium, low calcium causes increased symptoms. Cardiac changes. We see, again, like I said, it's not one of the electrolytes that are in the um, anion, the, the action potential. When we see the sodium, potassium, calcium pump, but the drug levels have to be normal for that to function properly. So when somebody has hypomagnesium, it can lead to 
dysrhythmias, peak T waves, VTAC, VFib can put them into ventricular dysrhythmias just like a low potassium does. So like I said, potassium, there's just very small amounts in the blood. Our body depletes it quickly. So low potassiums, we see these ventricular dysrhythmias very early on. This may take a little bit of time, but we do need to have magnesium in the blood for the three cardiac electrolytes to be working properly. So if we have a patient who's got a low potassium and a low mag, we can give them potassium all day long, but if their mags are low, the potassium won't stay in the blood and it won't work well. So we do wanna increase that magnesium to a normal level so those three cardiac electrolytes can work. Decreased magnesium levels, increased nerve impulses, think not sedated, like just like calcium. The majority of magnesium comes from our dietary, dietary intake. How do we treat hypomagnesemia? Just replace it. Last one here, I think we're done after that. Hypermagnesemia greater than 2.5, signs and symptoms of hypermagnesium. Again, sluggish, low, slow symptoms, drowsiness, decreased deep tendon reflexes, weaknesses, decreased respirations, which can lead to respiratory arrest. Cardiac changes, we're going to see cardiac changes with um, magnesium fluctuations that can be significant. Decreased pulse, sluggish, slow pulse, la prolonged PR, wide and slow QRS, which can certainly lead to cardiac arrest if it's low enough. Excessive magnesium acts like a sedative and decreases electrical conductions in the muscles, equaling sluggish okay just like calcium we see these sluggish symptoms what are causes well honestly here we go that's it right there when you see somebody with hypermagnesemia hyperphosphatemia hyperkalemia you know we got to be looking about what's going on why is the kidney not getting rid of the magnesium like it's supposed to be so that is a classic lab value in a chronic kidney patient they have high magnesiums. Maybe somebody's just taking too much, maybe in the ICU or the floor, we're replacing it, we're replacing it, we're replacing it, and then they end up having hypermagnesemia because we're replacing it too much. And antacids do contain a large amount of magnesium. And sometimes an older person might be just slugging antacids down and it can cause some, some increase in the magnesium. We just need to stop that. Treatment to get rid of it, loop diuretics. Loop diuretics take off fluid and all electrolytes doesn't hold on to calcium, doesn't hold on to potassium like other ones do. Loop diuretics take off all fluid and electrolytes. So loop diuretics are going to help get, um, with, the, with the excretion of electrolytes. 0.45% saline solution, okay, which is a hypotonic IV solution or IV calcium gluconate to help balance mag levels, calcium and magnesium, contraction, relaxation. So these do balance each other out. So calcium can certainly help to treat a hypermagnesemia. So something you may be familiar with if you work in the hospital. Hemodialysis with magnesium-free dialysate. Since the kidney problem may be present, hemodialysis may be needed to help decrease the serum magnesium. Again, generally we're seeing, we're looking at a kidney, a kidney problem right here. So those are just kind of some general concepts that um, you would need to know in regard to phosphorus and magnesium. And look, like I said earlier, fluid and electrolytes is a very tough concept, but we are looking at lab as diagnosticians. We are looking at sodiums. We are looking at potassiums all the time, every day. We're looking at the BMP, sodium, potassium, chloride, CO2, which I haven't even talked about those yet, this chloride and the CO2. We're looking at the BUN, creatinine, and blood sugar. Those are the BNP values that we're looking at. And often those are drawn in an acute care setting every single day. And so we want to understand what that means when somebody has low values. And what's most important is think of the common reasons that I talked about that causes these electrolyte imbalances. So thank you. Bye.